This lecture, Keynesianism, a Critique, accompanies the identically named Chapter 18 of my book, Capitalism, a Treatise on Economics. For maximum understanding, it should be heard after one has heard my lectures that accompany Chapters 2, 11 through 13, and 15, and best of all, has read and studied those chapters. I will begin by presenting the essential claims of Keynesianism and its close connection to what in Chapter 13 I describe as consumptionism, i.e. the belief that the fundamental problem of economic life is not that of increasing the production and supply of goods or wealth, but rather that of increasing the need and desire for goods, so that it may be adequate to the ability to produce goods. In effect, Keynesianism claims that what needs to be produced is not wealth, but the consumption of wealth. Keynesianism is the most complex and influential variant of what prior to the appearance of Keynes' book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in 1936, had been known simply as the overproduction doctrine. The overproduction doctrine claims that depressions and the mass unemployment that accompanies them are the result of the fact that at the point of full employment, the economic system is capable of producing more than its participants are willing and able either to consume or usefully employ in the production of goods in the future. In holding to this claim, Keynesianism denies both the proposition that the lower are prices and wages, the larger are the quantities of goods and services that people are able and willing to buy with any given quantity of money, and the further proposition, known as the quantity theory of money, that the volume of spending in the economic system is determined by the quantity of money. Their denial of the latter proposition follows from their denial of the former. For if, for example, people would buy no more with the same quantity of money in their possession and prices and wages fell in half, it follows that they would also buy no more with the quantity of money in their possession having been doubled while wages and prices remained the same. The Keynesians envision an infinite demand for cash holdings, i.e. unlimited cash hoarding. To increase the need and desire for goods, the older supporters of the overproduction doctrine urged, or at least took pleasure at their prospect, such things as wars, natural disasters, and fraudulent advertising, all of which were allegedly means of increasing the need and desire for goods, and thus indirectly for the labor required to produce goods. While the logic of the Keynesians is no different, their special emphasis is on the alleged need for government budget deficits, and their analysis is far more complicated. I want to say a few words about how and why Keynesianism became the dominant doctrine in macroeconomics, and did so very rapidly. There are two basic reasons. One is it played into the hands of the existing uh, outlook of, of economists in connection uh, with the Marxian exploitation theory. Notice uh, the uh, opposite view of Keynesianism was that in order to eliminate the unemployment associated with a depression, what was necessary was a fall in wage rates and prices. But uh, under the prevailing influence of Marxism, it was thought that if the government did nothing to maintain wages in such uh, forms as uh, la promoting labor unions, uh, uh, also uh, imposing minimum wage legislation, uh, controlling uh, other aspects of employment, such as working conditions, uh, the hours of work, uh, prohibiting child labor, and so on, it was thought that uh, there would be nothing uh, to prevent the capitalists from driving wages down to minimum subsistence, which they would do allegedly in very short order. So if you had an economic policy that uh, claimed uh, 
that full employment required the freedom for wage rates to fall, well, that was taken to mean that uh, full employment would require uh, the freedom for wage rates to go to minimum subsistence, uh, the hours of work to expand uh, to the maximum humanly uh, bearable, and so on. So the Keynesianism provided an excuse for economists not to have to be in a position of advocating such policies, which should put them in the position of being perceived as enemies of the human race. So uh, if Keynesianism were correct, it gave them a, they had a vested interest in thinking that Keynesianism was correct because it took them off the hook. If it's the case that uh, a fall in wages and prices cannot achieve full employment, well, then you don't have to advocate it. Uh, in conjunction with these uh, horrors claimed by the exploitation theory. So uh, that was uh, convenient for the great majority of economists uh, not to have to be advocating policies which were at odds with the uh, overwhelming majority of public opinion and also uh, with their own thinking too. Now then, uh, there was another factor that contributed to the rapid success of Keynesianism. And this uh, was a factor going back uh, 50 years or more uh, before uh, the publication of the general theory in 1936. And this was the loss of profound truths discovered by the British classical economists, such as Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and the Mills. Um, when uh, the theory of marginal utility displaced the labor theory of value, it was thought you had to abandon the entirety of classical economics. Not only the labor theory of value and the iron law of wages, the doctrine that uh, wages went to minimum subsistence, uh, but the whole of classical ec economics ended up being abandoned. And this included uh, major bulwarks against uh, the Keynesian views. Uh, above all, the uh, great role of saving in uh, economic activity. The classical economists were profoundly pro-saving, and they saw a much greater role uh, for saving than uh, do the con contemporary economists. And uh, part of that was uh, a doctrine known as the wages fund doctrine. Uh, they understood that wages were paid uh, not when consumers bought products, but when capitalists paid wages. Now, that was uh, just forgotten about. And so you had uh, things set up by the time Keynes appeared where uh, the foundations of the traditional views that in a depression you should not run at deficits, you should have balanced budgets, uh, we should have the freedom for wage rates and prices quickly to fall, to reestablish full employment, uh, all that uh, was either in conflict with uh, the prevailing views in connection with the exploitation theory uh, and uh, had lost its intellectual foundations. So that was the situation when Keynes appeared. I want to say a few words in connection with what has come to be called Neo-Keynesianism. This is Keynesianism ever so slightly modified in response to a, criticisms, to a criticism made by one of Keynes' contemporaries, uh, A.C. Pigou, uh, a, a colleague uh, who taught at the same period of time. According to Pigou, uh, a fall in wage rates and prices would at some point have to increase the volume of uh, goods and services purchased and make it possible uh, for increased output to find the market. Um, Pigou argued that uh, not all consumption was based on current income, the way Keynes, as we'll see, argued. Uh, Pigou claimed that some, perhaps small portion of consumption was based on accumulated financial assets. At the very least, these assets consisted of the money supply and a more or less substantial portion of the value of outstanding securities, such as stocks and bonds and that uh, this consumption was independent of the level of income and could be expected to hold up uh, so long as the value of the assets held up. Now, 
uh, if you had a fall in wages and prices, this portion of consumer spending, based on the value of accumulated assets, uh, would ultimately be sufficient, if there were a great enough fall in wages and prices, uh, to achieve full employment. The Keynesians accepted this uh, as a point of, of theory, or at least many of them did, but they had a counter-argument, which was, all right, all very well and good, but uh, we suspect that in order to uh, achieve perhaps 10% uh, additional employment, you might need prices and wages to fall 90%. Now, that would imply that we would end up with an, in an economy with the prices and wages being 10% of what they were, and output and employment uh, being 1.1 times what it was. And so if you multiply 0 0.1 times 1.1, I think you get 0.11, we'd have an 89% drop in spending to achieve a 10% uh, increase in output and employment, uh, which would imply that uh, if that happened, that uh, all debtors would be wiped out. And uh, conditions under a fractional reserve banking system, uh, it wouldn't, the things would actually be worse than that, uh, because the whole banking system would be wiped out, the quantity of money would be radically reduced, the financial base of accumulated assets, that would be utterly decimated. So uh, there would just be uh, no way to do this based on uh, this PIGU effect. So uh, that's uh, not much of a criticism. A serious critique of Keynes depends on showing that as far as they depend on spending, output and employment depend on not consumption expenditure, but productive expenditure, expenditure for the purpose of making subsequent sales, implicitly at a profit. And that productive expenditure depends on the saved, accumulated capital funds of employers. This is what determines the volume of business spending and the great bulk of sales revenues in the economic system. I deal with these facts and their implications primarily in chapters 11 and 14 through and including 19. I turn now to the Keynesian system, namely the unemployment equilibrium doctrine and its basis in the IS curve and its elements. Figure 18.1 from page 868 of Capitalism shows the precise meaning of the unemployment equilibrium doctrine. The figure is titled the Keynesian Aggregate Demand Curve and the Unemployment Equilibrium. Let's spend a few moments examining the details of this diagram. Over on the left we have the price and wage level. That's a vertical line that goes down to the origin uh, labeled zero. Uh, going over to the right on the horizontal axis, which is labeled capital Y, which is conventional in Keynesian economics, it stands, uh, its original meaning was national income. It quickly came to be used as signifying both money national income, how many billions of dollars of profits and wages there are and so forth, and also real physical output. Notice that right under uh, capital Y on the horizontal axis, um, we have uh, the text output slash employment. <clears throat> well, it's, that's the physical aspect of Y. It represents both uh, a, a greater quantity of uh, output based on a larger quantity of employment as we move from left to right. Now we have two vertical lines uh, more or less uh, in the center or center right of this diagram. One is labeled DD and the other SS. DD is the aggregate demand curve. That's uh, how much goods and implicitly labor <clears throat> to produce those goods. The economic system is prepared in the one case to buy, in the other case to employ. And uh, it's drawn in such a way uh, 
that the quantity is presented as fixed. There's just so much maximum output that the economy will buy or otherwise use, and uh, just that amount of labor required to produce it is what the economy um, will employ. Now notice uh, right below the uh, horizontal axis there is uh, uh, an item labeled Y sub 2%. That's uh, indicated, that, that's to show uh, what the precise quantity of uh, output demanded is. The output that corresponds to Y sub 2%. Now what does this signify? Well, that is uh, the volume of output and employment that uh, results in, or is allegedly results in, a, a rate of return on capital invested, a rate of profit, if you like, or a rate of interest of just 2%. That's critical. Uh, an essential doctrine of uh, the Keynesians is that there is some minimum uh, rate of return on capital below which people would simply prefer to hold cash without limit uh, rather than invest. And uh, typically uh, the Keynesians uh, took 2% as the rate of return uh, signifying that limit. If the rate of return fell below 2%, uh, people would simply not lend or invest. Now actually this 2% figure is not essential. We could uh, uh, substitute zero for two percent. The essential point is uh, the Keynesians are claiming that uh, the achievement of full employment would require a rate of return below the minimum rate of return at which people are willing to lend or invest. People would be willing to lend or invest allegedly uh, for a rate of return as low as two percent but not a lower rate of return. And unfortunately, uh, output at the point of full employment, uh, indicated by the uh, line SS, that's uh, aggregate supply uh, resulting from uh, full employment, the aggregate production that is the result of full employment, that um, volume of production and employment unfortunately uh, depends on the rate of return on capital invested being less than the acceptable minimum rate of return, the minimum acceptable rate of return. And it's labeled Y sub F. Y sub F is the, uh, that level of output and employment which goes with or which results in a rate of return on capital below the minimum acceptable rate. Whether that minimum acceptable rate is 2% or something less than 2% uh, as low as zero. Now, I, I think it's true if people expected no rate of return at all or a negative rate of return, uh, then they wouldn't invest. They'd rather hold cash. So that's that we can, can grant. But the Keynesians are claiming that uh, full employment necessarily requires a rate of return below the minimum people will accept, whether that minimum is 2%, 0, or something in between. I need to stress how this notion of a minimum acceptable rate of return below which people will not lend or invest, how that's crucial uh, to the idea of an unemployment equilibrium. Its implication is that if somehow the economic system did achieve full employment, the full employment would be accompanied by an unacceptably low rate of return, which means people would stop lending and investing. There'd be a major financial contraction and unemployment would be resumed. It would be stepped up again as uh, people stopped spending because they preferred to hold cash rather than lend or invest. So anytime the economic system got beyond uh, the unemployment equilibrium any time it started to move any further toward full employment uh, there'd be a resumption of the uh, of the depression which would push the economy back into mass unemployment all right so this is the meaning of figure 181
the change in aggregate demand curve, and uh, the unemployment equilibrium. Before leaving figure 18.1, I'd like everyone to note its obvious connection to the overproduction doctrine. The difference between the vertical line DD and the vertical line SS is the measure of alleged overproduction. SS is what the economy is capable of producing, at least at the point of full employment, and DD is all that the economic system wants to buy or otherwise use. So the excess is the measure of alleged overproduction. For further elaboration of that fact and its wider implications, I have to refer you to Part A of Chapter 13, which is uh, titled simply Productionism. We'll turn now to Figure 18.2, which appears on page 869 of Capitalism and is titled simply The I.S. Curve, the meaning of which we'll explain very, very shortly. This diagram, Figure 18.2, the I.S. Curve, shows the relationship, according to the Keynesians, between the rate of return on capital on the one axis and the volume of output and employment on the other. For equilibria, that's the plural of equilibrium, equilibria of investment and saving. We'll learn more about the nature of that uh, alleged equilibrium uh, as we proceed. Now notice on the uh, uh, vertical axis it says R percent. Well, that means, as I've indicated, the rate of profit, the rate of interest, the rate of return on capital. The Keynesians have their own language very often, and they call it the marginal efficiency of capital. You can think of it as the rate of profit. And notice uh, it runs from up uh, the, at the top of the axis all the way down to the origin, zero. So the, the rate of return could be anything from zero on up to uh, no particular limit. And on the horizontal axis, we have uh, the volume of uh, employment and the corresponding volume of output. And as we go far enough to the right, we reach uh, full employment. And on this particular diagram, it's uh, shown that full employment coincides with a rate of return on capital of just about zero. It's not necessary that it be zero. Uh, the essential point, according to the Keynesians, is that it's too low for investment to be worthwhile. And that zone of investment not being worthwhile is typically uh, alleged to be 2% or less, according to the Keynesians. And we have uh, this uh, horizontal line, dashed line, uh, labeled LM. And this is uh, a relationship between output and employment and the rate of return on capital for equilibria between liquidity preference and the quantity of money, LM, liquidity preference for L, or L for liquidity preference, M for the quantity of money. I won't uh, spend any uh, further time on the LM concept. Uh, it's sufficient that it's supposed to establish the minimum acceptable rate of return. So here we are, allegedly, according to the Keynesians, full employment requires a rate of return below the minimum acceptable rate, which is 2%. Or, as I've indicated, we could uh, make it zero and uh, uh, require that full employment have some rate of return uh, of less than zero. But this is the essential idea. So that's so much for uh, figure 18.2. The marginal efficiency of capital, the rate of profit, is supposed to decline as the volume of employment and the corresponding output increase. In this diagram, uh, 
a free economy's maximum achievable volume of employment as opposed to full employment would be well short of full employment. It would be found by dropping a vertical line from the point at which the 2% dash LM line intersects with the IS curve, dropping a vertical line from that point straight down to the horizontal axis. That would give us the economy's maximum achievable point of employment. To achieve full employment, we would have to go beyond that alleged uh, narrower limit and uh, get to full employment uh, by means, uh, as I've already indicated, of uh, government budget deficits and, as we'll also see, necessarily uh, an expansionary monetary policy uh, incompatible with the gold standard. All right, well, that's it for figure uh, 18.2. We turn now to figure 18.3, which is found on page 870 of Capitalism, and represents a combination of figures 18.1 and 18.2. In fact, it derives the position of the Keynesian aggregate demand curve from uh, the IS curve. From It derives the Keynesian aggregate demand curve in figure 18.1 from the IS curve of figure 18.2. Now, how does it do that? Well, the argument is that uh, we're locked in at the minimum acceptable rate of return of 2%. If that is truly the minimum acceptable rate of return, it's simply not possible to have uh, aggregate demand any greater. National income uh, cannot uh, be any greater because if it were somehow greater, the rate of return on capital would fall below the minimum acceptable rate. It would be lower than 2%. It would be further to the right of Y sub 2% and lower, lower down than uh, the 2% on the vertical axis. And now if that happened, if the rate of return were uh, somehow below the minimum acceptable rate, businessmen would stop lending and investing, they'd start hoarding, unemployment would uh, m increase again, and uh, production and output, uh, employment, all of that would be rolled back until the rate of return once again was restored uh, through the decline in output and employment uh, up to 2%. So the reason the uh, aggregate demand curve in uh, figure 18.1 is fixed where it is, is because if somehow it got to be the least bit further to the right, the rate of return on capital would be driven down below the minimum acceptable rate, and the uh, unwillingness of businessmen to lend or invest for such a low rate would cut back spending They'd hold on to cash rather than lend or invest it, and uh, that would reduce output and employment and uh, restore the rate of return to the minimum acceptable rate and uh, lock in unemployment or the level of it, positive employment uh, to no greater than Y sub 2%. The extent of alleged permanent inescapable unemployment in both of these diagrams is indicated by the difference, the uh, horizontal difference, between Y sub 2% and Y sub F. Y sub F represents full employment. Y sub 2% represents the maximum employment that is possible uh, in a free economy. And the difference is uh, the alleged uh, permanent, inescapable, involuntary unemployment. That's the essential idea. Now we turn to figure 18.4, which appears on page 871 of Capitalism. It's titled and is intended to explain the derivation of the IS curve. This is a set of five interconnected diagrams.
the only one of which is already familiar to us, is the IS curve, which is in the center over on the left. It's the second diagram on the left. Uh, to make things even more complete and tedious, uh, we could add in the uh, Keynesian aggregate demand curve uh, on the left-hand side at the very bottom, skipping down below uh, the curve labeled production function. I have to say, whenever I see a set of diagrams like this, I'm reminded of a song, an old popular song. I think it was called The Skeleton Dance. It went something like uh, the foot bones connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bones connected to the uh, leg bone, and on and on up to uh, the head. Uh, it's pretty humorous, ridiculous, really. Now, let's uh, examine these diagrams and then uh, see how they're supposed to explain the uh, derivation of the IS curve. Let me suggest, incidentally, that if you're watching uh, this presentation on a computer, uh, the best thing to do would be to use your mouse to trace the connections I'll be making verbally so you can see them visually and get a feel for it. If you're watching it on your uh, smartphone or a tablet, uh, perhaps you could use a, a pencil uh, to do the same thing, or the eraser end of the pencil, just so you trace the movements, the connections. I think that's uh, helpful. Uh, it adds a, a greater degree of concreteness. On the lower left, we have something called the production function, and it uh, on the horizontal axis has uh, output designated by uh, letter Y, different values of Y. And as I've already said uh, in previous discussion, uh, Y represents national income, uh, both in monetary terms, uh, so many billions or trillions of dollars now, and in real terms. And uh, the ideas are used uh, more or less interchangeably. The real national income and the monetary national income, they're used interchangeably in Keynesian economics. And uh, uh, they slide back and forth, uh, the Keynesians do, uh, between these two uh, versions, the real and the monetary. Now over on the left, on the vertical axis, we have the volume of employment. Uh, capital N, as in Nancy, is uh, taken as the uh, letter that uh, designates employment. And uh, the production function is a relationship between the volume of employment on the vertical axis and the volume of output on the horizontal axis. So we can start off, we have N sub zero, that's one particular value of employment, so many man years, let's say. So n sub zero results in an output of y sub zero. The larger volume of employment, n sub one, results in a larger volume of output, y sub one. And finally, at some point, we get um, n sub f, that's full employment. And the full employment volume of employment um, results in the full employment volume of production, the volume of production corresponding to full employment. That would allegedly be the result of full employment. Now, right above it, we have another diagram. It repeats the, uh, the horizontal axis. It's showing the same values of uh, Y, national income, real and or monetary. And of course, over on the, on the vertical axis, we have the rate of return on capital. And what the purpose of all this is, is to derive uh, why this or that particular rate of return on capital does accompany this or that particular uh, volume of output. Now, I often say volume of output and employment uh, implicitly uh, based on uh, the lower left diagram, uh, when you have the volume of output, uh, we have an imp uh, uh, based on this relationship, we ha implicitly have uh, 
a volume of employment. So over here on the uh, IS curve, when we've got Y sub F volume of output, that uh, implicitly means we also have um, N sub F uh, volume of employment. This would be the, the point of full employment output and full employment. You can take both together. All right. Now we're interested in finding out, as I say, why this or that particular rate of return accompanies this or that particular output. That will uh, tell us where the minimum acceptable rate of return, such as 2%, uh, happens to land. All right. Now we're going to skip up to the upper left-hand diagram, uh, third diagram. And this is labeled the saving function, the saving function. And we've got the same uh, horizontal axis, uh, real output, and implicitly uh, the level of employment. I said real output. Of course, it always means monetary output, too. All right. And now we have corresponding to each level of uh, output a definite volume of saving. For example, the Y sub zero level of output is accompanied by the S sub zero level of saving. And uh, the Y sub one level of output is accompanied by S sub one level of saving. And the full employment level of output is accompanied by the full employment level of saving. Uh, up higher up on the vertical axis. Now here in this diagram, it's important to transition to a monetary interpretation of, uh, of Y, of output, because now we're dealing with saving. And typically in the Keynesian view, saving is synonymous with hoarding, the hoarding of cash. It's a pile of accumulated cash. Now, it's difficult to see how to connect a growing pile of accumulated cash with a growing volume of uh, automobiles and bicycles and uh, women's dresses and so on and on. It's difficult to do that. So now we more or less have to think of national income of uh, output in monetary terms. If we're thinking of national income as so much money, that people are earning, well, then it's not unreasonable to think that out of that money that they're taking in in the form of income, they may be setting aside some in the, in the form of a pile of accumulated cash. So we have to switch our focus. That's not done explicitly in the Keynesian analysis, but it's there, and that's what we have to do, at least implicitly. Now, um, we're going to swing over to the uh, top right. And uh, once again, on the vertical axis, we're going to have saving uh, indicated on the uh, vertical axis and the same values of saving as before. And now here, it's very, very clear that we're talking in monetary terms, or the Keynesians are, and that's what we'll do to follow them. All right. So at uh, these various levels of output corresponding to various levels of employment, we've got various levels of hoarding of cash. So at uh, the Y0 level of output, real national income, we have S0 accumulation of cash, of hoarding of cash. And similarly, um, we have S1 hoarding of cash at the higher level of output, uh, real monetary, real and monetary national income. And finally, we have a full employment level of saving, a full employment level of hoarding. Now, the Keynesians don't want this money to remain hoarded. Only for the briefest instant is it to be hoarded. It has to be put back into the economic system. And the means of doing that is investment. So we'll look here on the horizontal axis of this fourth diagram in the upper right hand corner. We have on the uh, horizontal axis the volume of investment. 
investment can be thought of as uh, savings that are spent in buying uh, capital goods. So notice, uh, we will we'll review from the beginning. The greater the employment over in the bottom uh, left-hand diagram, the greater the employment, the greater the national income real output. We're using them interchangeably. Coming up uh, to the upper right-hand diagram, upper left-hand diagram, we have uh, the uh, the same uh, measures of output and employment, same measures of national income, and now we're getting different volumes of cash hoarding emanating from that. Coming over to the right, it's necessary for that cash hoarding to be offset by investment. So the uh, greater the cash hoarding, the greater the need for investment. S0 of hoarding can be offset by uh, I0 of investment. S1 of saving cash hoarding can be offset by I1 of investment. Full employment saving, the level of saving that takes place at full employment, would need to be offset by a full employment level of investment, a significantly larger level of investment. Okay, so let's hold that in mind. The greater the volume of employment, the greater the national income, the greater the degree of saving and cash hoarding, the greater the corresponding need for investment to put those hoards back into circulation. All right, and now we get to the crucial point. We get to the crucial point. As investment increases, and we come down to the uh, lower right-hand diagram, which is labeled or, uh, the marginal efficiency of capital schedule. I think there's only the abbreviation here, MEC, marginal efficiency of capital. The marginal efficiency of capital schedule shows on the uh, horizontal axis growing volumes of investment. I sub zero, I sub one, I sub F, that's full employment investment. And on the vertical axis, we have the rate of return. So notice, corresponding to the very modest uh, amount of investment, I sub zero, there's a fairly high rate of return, R sub zero. As investment increases, as we get to uh, I sub one of investment, the rate of return on capital is going to be less. It's going to be R sub one. And when we get to the full employment level of investment, well then the uh, rate of return on capital is going to be lower still, and it's going to be R sub F, the full employment rate of return. That full employment rate of return is below 2%, which is drawn over on the vertical axis, on the side of the vertical axis. And that's, uh, the, that corresponds, that's the minimum acceptable rate of return. So here we've got full employment, once again, resulting in a rate of return below the minimum acceptable rate. Now, if we extend these values from the marginal efficiency of capital schedule over to the left, well, we're going to uh, uh, put these values into the IS curve, because what's over to the left in the center of this overall layout is the IS curve. So let's uh, review this whole tangle of relationships again. We start off with a certain modest amount of employment, N sub zero. That results in Y sub zero of national income in money terms and physical terms. We come up with this uh, relatively modest level of national income, and we keep going up. And that gives us a certain modest level of saving. We're thinking now of national income in terms of dollars that people have received and their hoarding part of it. And as uh, employment increases to N1, uh, the volume of national income is greater. And so too is the volume of hoarding. We have S sub uh, 
two uh, S sub one of hoarding, and uh, that requires uh, a greater volume of investment. Um, as we continue, if we have full employment, we get the, the full employment level of national income, the national income that would be produced at full employment coming on up. That gives us a much larger amount of cash hoarding, uh, saving at the full employment level of saving. That uh, full employment level of saving, if it's to be kept in circulation and not to uh, stay in hoards, that requires a full employment level of investment. But now coming down, that full employment level of investment results in the full employment marginal efficiency of capital, which is too low, too low for people to be willing to lend and invest. So that's how we get into the unemployment equilibrium. And that's how we derive the IS curve. The IS curve is a set of uh, output values, a set of national income values on the horizontal axis and it ends up being accompanied by a set of rates of return on the vertical axis. Those rates of return uh, coming from uh, the marginal efficiency of capital schedule over on the right. All right, well, I think we can uh, uh, say goodbye to figure uh, 18.4, and we'll have some, uh, a few more figures to go through. All right, so that's it for 18.4. I turn now to figure 18.5, which appears on page 874 of Capitalism. This figure once again shows the MEC curve. The only thing that is different about it is the information that appears under the horizontal axis of the diagram. This information shows the magnitude of net investment in physical terms in three different sets of circumstances each corresponding to a different price and wage level. For example, the data point provided by the combination of a 2% rate of return on the vertical axis and I sub 2% on the horizontal axis is shown as having a monetary value of 250 units of money in the case of the initial uppermost price and wage level and then a monetary value of 225 units of money at a price and wage level 10% lower, and finally, a monetary value of only 125 units of money at a price and wage level half as great. The purpose of this diagram is to illustrate the proposition that the MEC schedule is the relationship between the rate of return and physical amounts of net investment, not monetary amounts of net investment. This is why a fall in the price and wage level is held to be incapable of achieving full employment. If, for example, starting with the price and wage level at which the allegedly minimum acceptable rate of return of 2% is reached as soon as net investment reaches 250 units of money, a halving of prices and wages cannot be accompanied by so much as even one hammer and screwdriver of additional real physical net investment. For that would allegedly drive the rate of return, even if just ever so slightly, below the minimum acceptable rate of 2%. And by the same token, net investment supposedly cannot possibly remain at 250 units of money in the face of a halving of prices and wages. For at half the price and wage level, net investment in physical terms would now be at the level where it would have been if somehow it could have been at 500, which would imply a rate of return far below the minimum acceptable rate of 2%, a rate most likely far into negative territory. A fall in wage rates and prices is held to be useless in achieving full employment because all of the relationships reflected in the IS curve supposedly hold true in physical terms. N sub F of employment means Y sub F of output, means S sub F of saving, 
requiring I sub F of net investment, which causes too low a rate of return. These same physical relationships allegedly hold irrespective of the wage and price level. Specifically, at a lower wage and price level it is held, no more physical lend investment is profitable, yields more than 2% than before. If, for example, initially there is 250 of investment at a 2% rate of return, and say approximately 10% on employment, a fall in wage rates and prices to 9 tenths of their initial height will not achieve full employment. Indeed, it will supposedly not achieve any increase in employment at all. This is because investment will allegedly have to fall 10% to 225, that is, in full proportion to the fall in wage rates and prices. It is claimed that investment must fall in this way because all the investment that there is room for at a 2% or greater rate of return is allegedly that physical amount of investment, for example, so many steel mills, cement factories, bicycle shops, and so forth, which at the initial price and wage level requires 250 to purchase. At a price and wage level nine-tenths as high, that physical amount of net investment requires only 225 to purchase. Net investment cannot remain at 250 in money because then 250 of monetary net investment would be equivalent to approximately 278 of net investment at the initial price and wage level. That is, at nine-tenths times the initial price and wage level, 250 would be the equivalent in buying power to ten-ninths times 250, which is 278. This greater physical amount of net investment would mean a rate of return below 2%. Thus, all that net investment can be at the nine-tenths price and wage level is 225, because now 225 represents the alleged maximum physical quantity of net investment that is profitable. In exactly the same way, if the wage and price level were to fall all the way to half, the monetary amount of net investment would supposedly also have to fall in half to 125 from 250. It allegedly could not remain at 250 or even at 225 because monetary amounts of net investment at those levels would now represent real physical net investment equivalent to what 500 purchased at the initial price and wage level or what 450 would purchase at 9 tenths the initial price and wage level. Such volumes of net investment would allegedly thus result in a rate of return all the more below 2%. At a halved wage and price level, net investment cannot get beyond 125 in money it is held, because that sum now represents the maximum physical amount of net investment that is profitable. Thus, despite the fall in wage rates and prices, the problem that allegedly remains is that there cannot be an outlet for saving in excess of the given physical amount of net investment that is profitable, i.e. that yields 2% or more. And thus there cannot be a real income output that results in any such greater level of saving, nor finally a volume of employment that would result in any such level of output. The volume of employment is thus allegedly limited to that amount that results in a level of output, real income, out of which saving is no greater than is consistent with the allegedly limited physical volume of profitable investment opportunities. In other words, according to the Keynesians, there cannot lastingly be a level of employment, output, and real income greater than what produces the limited volume of saving that can be accommodated by the limited volume of profitable investment opportunities. If the volume of employment is greater, than the one that produces such a limited level of saving, then savings supposedly exceed the limited profitable investment opportunities that exist, thereby driving the rate of return on capital below the minimum acceptable level. The alleged consequences are that hoarding results, spending drops, and sales revenues, employment, and output all decline.
Their decline then represents a drop in real income. Out of the smaller real income, less saving occurs. The drop in employment output and real income must allegedly be great enough to reduce the volume of saving to the point where it no longer exceeds the allegedly limited profitable investment opportunities available. In sum, full employment or any employment beyond a fixed given amount cannot exist or at least cannot be maintained, according to the Keynesians, because it would produce a physical volume of output, out of which there would be a physical volume of saving, requiring a physical volume of net investment that would put the rate of return below the minimum acceptable rate. In essence, the Keynesian argument is that full employment cannot exist in a free economy because if it did, the economic system would, in effect, choke on the allegedly excessive saving that would accompany full employment. Keynes himself states the essence of his position in the following words. Where helpful, I insert my own clarifications parenthetically. Quote, Perhaps it will help to rebut the crude conclusion that a reduction in money wages will increase employment, quote, because it reduces the cost of production, unquote, if we follow up the course of events on the hypothesis most favorable to this view, namely that at the outset, entrepreneurs expect the reduction in money wages to have this effect. It is indeed not unlikely that the individual entrepreneur, seeing his own costs reduced, will overlook at the outset the repercussions on the demand for his product and will act on the assumption that he will be able to sell at a profit a larger output than before. If then entrepreneurs generally act on this expectation, will they in fact succeed in increasing their profits? Only if the community's marginal propensity to consume is equal to unity, so that there is no gap between the increment of income and the increment of consumption, i.e. there is no additional saving, or if there is an increase in investment corresponding to the gap between the increment of income and the increment of consumption, which will only occur if the schedule of marginal efficiencies of capital has increased relatively to the rate of interest, i.e. either the MEC schedule must somehow move to the right, which there is allegedly no reason for its doing, or the rate of interest must fall, which it can't do if it is already at 2%. Thus, the proceeds realized from the increased output will disappoint the entrepreneurs and employment will fall back again to its previous figure, unless the marginal propensity to consume is equal to unity, i.e. there is no additional saving, or the reduction in money wages has had the effect of increasing the schedule of marginal efficiencies of capital relative to the rate of interest, and hence the amount of investment. Keynes, of course, means the increase in the amount of investment that is profitable, i.e. yields 2% or more. For if entrepreneurs offer employment on a scale which, if they could sell their output at the expected price, would provide the public with incomes out of which they would save more than the amount of current investment, entrepreneurs are bound to make a loss equal to the difference. And this will be the case absolutely irrespective of the level of money wages. End quote. This passage appears in the general theory on pages 261 to 262. I have stressed the last sentence because if any single sentence of Keynes can express the theoretical substance of his doctrine, this is the one. Another passage from Keynes that provides conclusive support for my exposition of his views is this one, which appears earlier in the general theory. Quote, the position of equilibrium under conditions of laissez-faire will be one in which employment is low enough and the standard of living sufficiently miserable to bring savings to zero. Assuming correct foresight, the equilibrium stock of capital will, of course, be a smaller stock than would correspond to full employment of the available labor, for it will be the equipment which corresponds to that proportion of unemployment which ensures zero saving. The general theory, pages 217 to 218. Strictly speaking, Keynes should have said 
zero saving in excess of the volume that reduces the rate of return to the alleged minimum further irreducible rate of return. The Keynesian solution for unemployment, fiscal policy. This discussion of fiscal policy occurs in capitalism on pages 876 to 878. The Keynesian solution to the alleged unemployment equilibrium of capitalism is government budget deficits, euphemistically called fiscal policy. The purpose of the budget deficits is to absorb the excess saving that allegedly would otherwise take place at full employment. Figure 18.6 shows the nature of the gains the Keynesians believe government budget deficits achieve. The diagram in figure 18.6 is the same as that in the upper right portion of figure 18.4, that is, the saving equals investment diagram. But it shows investment as equal to saving minus the deficit instead of saving in full. The deficit, according to the Keynesians, serves as an additional outlet for saving and thus reduces the amount flowing through to net investment. This is shown in the diagram by the drawing of a second 45 degree line above the first one by a vertical distance equal to the amount of the deficit, which is represented by D on the vertical axis. This new 45 degree line is labeled S minus D equals I, saving minus the deficit equals net investment, in contrast to S equals I, which is the label describing the first 45 degree line. Note that when saving equals the deficit, investment equals zero, as shown by the intersection of the new 45 degree line with the vertical axis at point D. Because both are 45 degree lines, the new line is not only above the original one by the amount of the deficit, but also to the left of it by the amount of the deficit. This depicts the idea that every given amount of saving now requires an amount of investment that is less than itself by the amount of the deficit. The crucial result is supposed to be that for any given level of employment, output, and saving, the amount of investment required to prevent hoarding is less than it otherwise would be by the amount of the deficit. Since there is less investment, the further crucial result is supposed to be that the rate of return on capital is now higher for any given level of employment, output, and saving. By the same token, it takes more employment, output, and saving to achieve the same rate of return as previously. In other words, the effect of the deficit is supposedly to shift the IS curve up and to the right. This result is confirmed by drawing the new saving minus the deficit equals investment line in the upper right diagram of figure 18.4 and then examining the effect on the IS curve. Each N, Y, and S point will be found to go with a lower I and thus a higher R point. This is shown in figure 18.7, which in essence substitutes figure 18.6 for the upper right diagram of figure 18.4. What the set of diagrams in figure 18.7 purports to show is that thanks to the government's budget deficit, for any given volume of employment, output, real income, and saving, there is less investment, and thus a higher rate of return on capital than before. Thus, there can be more employment, output, real income, and saving before the volume of investment becomes so large as to push the rate of return on capital to the minimum acceptable level of 2%. With a large enough deficit, argue the Keynesians, there can be full employment. The whole process is described by the upward and rightward movement of the IS curve. Following along the dashed lines, Notice how the same magnitudes of employment, n sub 0, n sub 1, and n sub f, continue to result in the same magnitudes of output, real income, and saving, namely y0, y1, and yf, and s0, s1, and sf, respectively. But now, s0 of saving requires less than i0 of net investment. s1 of saving now requires less than i1 of net investment.
And what is supposedly critical, SF of saving now requires sufficiently less than the old IF volume of net investment, that full employment can now take place at a rate of return above 2%. The new relationships to investment and the rate of return are indicated by lines composed of plus signs, which run downward from the saving minus the deficit equals investment line to the MEC schedule, and then across to the left to the various values of Y resulting from the various values of n. To describe matters verbally, one could say this. The alleged problem of capitalism, according to the Keynesians, is that full employment results in a volume of saving that the economic system cannot profitably invest. In effect, such saving is a destructive byproduct of full employment under capitalism, and thus prevents the existence of full employment. It is a kind of toxic excrescence a veritable boil on the economic body that interferes with its vital functioning. Fortunately, however, there is a doctor, and he has a cure for the problem. The doctor is the government, and the cure is a deficit in its budget. As Keynes has explained matters, the government doctor will lance the savings boil and allow its destructive juices to flow into the waiting pan of the government's budget deficit rather than into the private investment, where it would reduce the rate of return on capital to an intolerably low level. A different, perhaps less distasteful analogy can be used. Capitalism, we might imagine, cannot have full employment because of the existence of a hard drink function rather than a saving function. As employment and real income rise, people feel themselves able to afford to drink more. At the point of full employment, they drink so much that they are physically hung over on the weekends to such an extent that they are incapable of working on Mondays. This too would represent a kind of unemployment equilibrium. Once again, a case might be made for the intervention of a good government doctor. It might siphon off people's liquor money with the sale of soft drinks, 2% beer, or perhaps even methadone. Or perhaps it might work to divert their liquor money onto ecclesiastical collection plates, in effect buying bonds issued in the name of heaven rather than in, than in its name. Innumerable analogies to the unemployment equilibrium doctrine can be created on the basis of environmentalism. That doctrine, of course, holds that economic activity is replete with self-destructive byproducts. On the basis of it, one could easily invent all kinds of mathematical functions analogous to the saving function. Then all one would need to do is arbitrarily assert some fixed limit to the capacity of the world to cope with the particular byproduct. On that basis, one could proceed to argue that employment and production must be limited to the point of not generating an amount of such byproduct in excess of the alleged fixed limit. Indeed, this is precisely what the environmentalists are doing in the case of carbon dioxide emissions and garbage disposal. Only instead of seeking to impose an unemployment equilibrium by forcibly holding down the volume of employment, they seek to impose limits on the productivity of labor and the volume of consumption. But just as with Keynesianism and its budget deficits, there is still an alleged need for the good government doctor. In the case of the carbon dioxide emissions, it is sometimes argued that the alleged low productivity of labor equilibrium might be overcome to some extent by virtue of government-imposed tree planting programs. These would play the same kind of role in the absorption of allegedly harmful carbon dioxide as government uh, budget deficits are supposed to play in the absorption of allegedly harmful saving. The essential common element in Keynesianism and environmentalism is the belief that free individuals are engaged in essentially self-destructive activity that, if it can be remedied at all, can only be remedied by the coercive power of the state. I turn now to the reasons Keynes advances on behalf of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine. For the essential point that needs to be challenged in Keynesianism, 
is its claim that as employment, output, income, saving, and net investment increase, the rate of return on capital decreases. Concerning this claim, Keynes writes, quote, If there is an increased investment in any given type of capital during any period of time, the marginal efficiency of that type of capital will diminish as the investment in it is increased, partly because the prospective yield will fall as the supply of that type of capital is increased, and partly because, as a rule, pressure on the facilities for producing that type of capital will cause its supply price to increase. Thus, for each type of capital, we can build up a schedule showing by how much investment in it will have to increase within the period in order that its marginal efficiency should fall to any given figure. We can then aggregate these schedules for all the different types of capital so as to provide a schedule relating the rate of aggregate investment to the corresponding marginal efficiency of capital in general, which that rate of investment will establish. We shall call this the investment demand schedule, or alternatively, the schedule of the marginal efficiency of capital. Keynes' statement appears on page 136 of the general theory. When Keynes speaks of rising supply prices of capital assets as investment demand increases and causes pressure on the facilities for producing capital goods, what he has in mind is the notion that more net investment constitutes additional demand for capital assets and thus raises their prices. His further belief that increasing net investment results in declining yields to capital assets is based in part on the conviction that as more productive capacity is brought into existence as the result of the net investment, the selling prices of products will fall because of their larger supply. In addition, the yields to capital assets will allegedly fall because of the operation of the law of diminishing returns. Successive equal increments of even at constant purchase prices of capital assets, supposedly result in diminishing physical returns to the successive doses of capital assets purchased. To express these ideas in terms of a simple example, we might imagine that initially the price of a machine that turns out widgets is $1,000, and that its use enables the same quantity of labor to produce 10 additional widgets every year which have a selling price of $10 each. On the simplifying assumption that this machinery will last forever and that the cost of materials and fuel can be ignored, the implied rate of return is 10% per year, 10 additional widgets times $10 divided by $1,000. Now, however, there is a demand for two such machines. As a result, the purchase price rises above 1000 say to a thousand fifty. In addition, the selling price of widgets will fall somewhat because of their larger supply, say to nine dollars and fifty cents. Finally, because of diminishing returns, it may be possible to obtain only nine additional widgets instead of ten by virtue of the employment of the second machine. The operation of any one of these factors, it is held, reduces the rate of return. Their combined operation in this example must reduce the rate of return from 10% to not much more than 8%. $9.50 times 9 widgets divided by $1,050. In these ways, more net investment is held to reduce the rate of return on capital. Now let us begin a critique of the ISLM analysis, starting with the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and the fallacy of context dropping. The Keynesian's use of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine is a prime example of a major logical fallacy identified by Ayn Rand, which she calls context dropping. Context dropping is the fallacy of denying, forgetting, or otherwise contradicting the context that is under discussion.
An example of context dropping from outside the field of economics is the following. Imagine a group of aeronautical engineers who are working on the problem of how to increase the speed of an airplane. They know that other things being equal, the lighter the weight of the plane, the faster it will fly. If, to make the plane lighter, they concluded that its engines should be eliminated, they would be committing the fallacy of context dropping. For the context under discussion is the flight of a heavier-than-air machine, which is possible only by virtue of its possession of engines. Another example of context dropping would be an esoteric discussion of the effects of living or working on the, on the tenth floor of a building, which discussions somehow manage to deny or otherwise contradict the existence of any one or more of the lower nine floors of the building or of its foundation. The use of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine is an example of context dropping for the following reasons. The context under discussion is the question, can a fall in wage rates and prices achieve full employment or can it not? This question is the context which must always be kept in mind. It is the context within which the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine is advanced in order to show why a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment. Yet, as will quickly be made apparent, every one of the three grounds advanced in support of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and which were described just a very few minutes ago, flatly contradicts the context under discussion. Once again, the context under discussion is the ability of lower wage rates and prices to achieve full employment. This context, of course, implies lower unit costs of production, for that is what lower wage rates achieve both directly and through bringing about lower prices of materials and machinery, and capital goods in general. The achievement of full employment also implies the availability of more labor in production relative to the existing supply of capital goods. In a state of mass unemployment, the factories and machinery exist in virtually the same quantity as before the onset of the depression and the unemployment. But they are largely idle. The ratio of capital to labor employed is correspondingly high. As full employment is approached and more and more workers return to the factories, the ratio of capital to labor correspondingly falls. Now this whole context is contradicted by the use of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine to show why a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment. The use of the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine enables the Keynesians to end up claiming that a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment precisely by dropping the context of a fall in wage rates and prices and rise in employment and switching to an altogether different, indeed opposite, context which could exist only if wage rates, production costs, and prices rose instead of fell. For the context to which the Keynesians deftly switch is one of a rise in the prices of capital assets, no fall in the costs of production, but constant or indeed rising costs of production, and no increase in the quantity of labor employed relative to the supply of capital goods in existence, but, on the contrary, a further increase in the supply of capital goods relative to the supply of labor that is employed. Recall that the first reason advanced in support of the falling marginal efficiency of capital was the claim that as more net investment took place to offset the additional saving accompanying the additional employment, the prices of capital assets would rise in response to the increase in demand for capital assets allegedly constituted by the additional net investment. The actual fact is, of course, that in the context of the elimination of unemployment, 
by means of a fall in wage rates and prices, the prices of capital assets would fall, not rise. Keynes and his followers thus totally contradict the context under discussion. They claim that a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment because if, instead of falling, as they necessarily would in these circumstances, the prices of capital assets rose, the rate of return on capital would be reduced. Furthermore, it is curiously ironic that in arriving at their bizarre conclusion that the prices of capital assets would rise in the midst of a fall in wage rates and prices, the Keynesians commit precisely the fallacy that the arch Keynesian Professor Samuelson is at such pains to warn new students of economics against, namely the fallacy of confusing the increase in the quantity of a good demanded that takes place in response to a lower price of the good with an increase in the demand for the good. Precisely this fallacy is what is present in the Keynesians' belief that the rise in net investment that accompanies the fall in wage rates and prices and the restoration of full employment constitutes a rise in the demand for capital assets and thus acts to raise their prices. The fact is that the additional net investment presupposes and is in response to lower prices of capital assets and can endure only so long as the prices of the capital assets are lower. It does not operate to raise those prices. And this is true even if one were to grant the legitimacy of conceiving of the additional net investment as representing an additional total expenditure of money for the capital assets. It would still be necessary to keep in mind that the larger expenditure of money was in response to lower prices and could endure only so long as the prices of capital assets remained lower. Recall that the second reason advanced for the declining marginal efficiency of capital was the claim that more net investment means more capacity in place, which means lower selling prices of products, which, other things being equal, means a fall in profitability. Here the context dropping consists of forgetting that other things, namely the costs of production, are not equal. Precisely a fall in wages and costs is what brings about the additional production and the decline in prices. Lower prices founded on lower costs of production do not reduce profitability or the so-called marginal efficiency of capital. Again, the Keynesians contradict the context. They argue that a fall in wages, costs, and prices cannot achieve full employment because if all that occurred were the fall in selling prices and no fall in costs, indeed a rise in costs because of the alleged rise in the prices of capital assets, the rate of return on capital would fall. This, of course, is totally absurd. It is absurd to argue against the ability of a fall in wage rates and costs of production to achieve full employment on the grounds that if there were no fall in costs of production, but somehow only a fall in the prices of the products, full employment could not be achieved. This dropping and switching of context enables the Keynesians to fail to see that the lower selling prices of products are offset and in fact more than offset by a fall in costs of production and thus that there is not only no fall in the rate of profit, the marginal efficiency of capital, but an actual rise in the rate of profit in consequence of the fall in wages and costs of production. Finally, it should be recalled that the third reason advanced in support of the declining marginal efficiency of capital was the claim that diminishing returns would accompany the additional net investment that was required to offset the additional saving taking place as employment output and real income expanded. Now putting aside the actual irrelevance of the law of diminishing returns to the rate of profit, and assuming for the sake of argument that it did have a determining effect, the truth is that in the context of a fall in wage rates and prices, an increase in the volume of employment and output, the physical returns to capital goods would increase rather than decrease. 
This is because as the economic system moves from mass unemployment to full employment, the supply of labor employed in production increases at a more rapid rate than the supply of capital goods. This is so because in the conditions of mass unemployment, a substantial supply of capital goods previously used in production continues to exist in the form of idle machines and factories. Its existence relative to the diminished number of workers employed constitutes an unusually high ratio of capital to labor. As the workers come back into the factories and once again take up the use of these capital goods, the ratio of capital to labor sharply declines. Such increase in the supply of capital goods as occurs, as the result of additional employment, output, real income, and saving, is a purely derivative phenomenon. The fundamental primary phenomenon is the increase in the ratio of labor employed to capital goods, which implies increasing returns to capital goods, not decreasing returns. If ever there were a problem of too low physical returns to capital goods, nothing could be a surer cure than the employment of more labor. Whatever problem might be imagined to exist, it would necessarily be less at the point of full employment than at the point of mass unemployment, or any unemployment. As an illustration of this fact, imagine that in conditions of unemployment, there are 12 units of capital goods and three workers employed, who produce a net output of three units of goods. The achievement of full employment means, let us assume, the employment of four workers who produce a net output of four units of goods. If fully one half of the additional net output of one unit is saved, the ratio of capital goods to labor still falls dramatically from 12 to 3, i.e. 4 to 1, to 12.5 to 4, i.e. 3.125 to 1. And this principle continues to hold, even if it were the case that the long-term continuation of full employment and steady saving and net investment of a half of a unit of net output per year ultimately resulted in a ratio of capital to labor of, say, 24 to 4, i.e. 6 to 1, at the point of full employment. This is because, in that case, with the same unemployment as before, the ratio of capital to labor would be 24 to 3, i.e. 8 to 1. Thus, the movement from unemployment to full employment would still reduce the ratio of capital to labor and increase the physical returns to capital goods, not decrease them. The procedure of the Keynesians, of course, is to forget the existence of the fundamental phenomenon, the increase in the supply of labor employed, as the economic system goes from unemployment to full employment, and to focus on the secondary derivative phenomenon, the increase in the supply of capital goods that results from the saving out of the net output of the additional workers employed. In this way, the Keynesians proceed to assume that the ratio of capital goods to labor rises and the physical returns to capital goods fall at the very time that exactly the opposite is true. Thus, the Keynesians end up claiming that full employment cannot take place on the grounds that if extra employment did not mean an increase in the ratio of labor to capital, but somehow the opposite, namely an increase in the ratio of capital to labor, full employment could not exist. By virtue of the too low rate of profit allegedly resulting from the relative overabundance of capital goods. In a word, the Keynesians end up denying that full employment can exist by confusing the effects of its existence with the effects of its non-existence. Indeed, the whole process by which the Keynesians reach the conclusion that a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment is nothing more than a refusal to consider its actual existence. Instead of considering the existence of a fall in wage rates, costs, and prices, and the employment of a larger number of workers, they choose to consider the totally different and opposite case of a rise in the prices of capital assets, of no fall in the costs of production, but only in the selling prices of products, 
and of no increase in the supply of labor employed, but only of an increase in the supply of capital goods that derives from that employment. Then, on the basis of their consideration of this totally opposite and thoroughly illegitimate case, in which down has literally become up, namely a fall in the prices of capital assets has become a rise in the prices of capital assets, and in which effects have been divorced from their causes, that is, the fall in selling prices has been divorced from its cause, the fall in wage rates and costs, and the additional net investment and capital accumulation has been divorced from its cause, which is the employment of additional workers with the capital goods already in existence, they conclude that they have proven something about the case at hand. All they have actually proven is their own capacity for confusion, if not intellectual dishonesty. The marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and the claim that the rate of profit is lower in the recovery from a depression than in the depression. There are further major criticisms which must be made of the Keynesian analysis in connection with the marginal efficiency of capital doctrine. The Keynesian claim that a fall in wage rates and prices cannot achieve full employment because at full employment the rate of return on capital would be too low is a claim that the rate of return in the recovery from a depression is lower than it is in the depression. What the Keynesians claim is that the economic system cannot recover from mass unemployment and depression, because if somehow it did, the rate of return on capital would fall, which means that it would be lower in the, in the recovery from the depression than it was in the depression. In effect, the Keynesians tell us that if we think the rate of profit is low now, in the conditions of mass unemployment and depression, we should wait and see what it will look like in the recovery. In the state of mass unemployment and depression, it is already at the minimum acceptable level, in the neighborhood of 2%. And at full employment, it would have to be lower still, they say. Indeed, according to the Keynesians, if somehow the economic system did temporarily manage to recover and achieve full employment, it would immediately have to return to the conditions of mass unemployment and depression as the means of elevating the rate of profit above the still lower level that is supposed to exist in the recovery. This is the actual meaning of the whole Keynesian argument for the unemployment equilibrium. That this is the actual meaning of the unemployment equilibrium doctrine is confirmed by nothing less than the core diagram of Keynesianism, the IS curve itself, which appeared as figure 18.2. Please study this diagram. Look carefully at the relationship depicted between the rate of return on capital on the vertical axis and the volume of output and employment on the horizontal axis. The diagram shows full employment imposing an MEC of barely above zero. Meanwhile, the economic system is languishing with substantial unemployment at the minimum acceptable rate of return of 2%. Movement from the output employment level corresponding to a 2% rate of interest slash MEC to the full employment level will allegedly drive the MEC to zero justifying my remark that if you think the rate of return is low in the midst of depression and mass unemployment, wait until you see what it looks like in recovery, according to the Keynesians. And then, with the still lower rate of return allegedly characterizing full employment and recovery, in order to raise the rate of return back up to the minimum acceptable level, it's necessary to reestablish mass unemployment through a plunge in spending, output, employment, and saving down to the point where the lower level of saving can be accommodated by limited profitable opportunities for investment. Next, the unemployment equilibrium doctrine and the claim that saving and net investment are at their maximum possible limits at the very time they are actually negative. An equally profound and closely related reversal of economic reality, 
on the part of the Keynesian analysis is its belief that in a depression, saving and net investment are at their maximum possible limits, and the problem is that full employment requires that they be carried still further. This, of course, is the alleged proximate cause of the marginal efficiency of capital having to be pushed below its minimum acceptable level. The actual fact is, however, that far from being at their maximum limits, saving and net investment are extremely low or even negative in a depression. For example, in the Great Depression following 1929, corporate saving, undistributed corporate profits, was negative in every year from 1930 to 1936, and again in 1938. Personal saving was negative in 1932 and 1933, and barely more than zero in 1934. Net investment was negative in the years 1931 to 1935, and again in 1938. There should be nothing surprising in these facts. They are logically implied in the very nature of a depression and mass unemployment. When people are out of work, they must live off their savings. In a state of mass unemployment, the consumption of savings in this way is necessarily very considerable. At the same time, corporations are under pressure to continue to pay dividends to their stockholders, even though they are currently earning little or no profits. To pay dividends under such conditions, they must dip into their accumulated savings, their earned surplus accounts. Unincorporated businesses, of course, are under the same kind of pressure. They, too, must frequently continue to support their owners, even though their current profits are insufficient to do so. In these ways, the current saving of those individuals and business firms who are still in a position to save out of their incomes is more than offset, and saving in the economy as a whole becomes non-existent, or indeed becomes negative. The fact that net investment becomes negative can be understood by direct inference, either from the fact that saving out of income becomes negative, or from the fact that in a depression, productive expenditure sharply declines, in particular, productive expenditure for fixed assets, such as plant and equipment. A plunge in productive expenditure for fixed assets implies a fall in net investment, because at the same time, depreciation charges hardly change at all, since they are based on a percentage of the productive expenditure for fixed assets made over a long period of prior years. Net investment in fixed assets actually becomes negative to the extent that current productive expenditure for fixed assets drops below depreciation charges. To that extent, the sum of the subtractions from the fixed asset accounts in the economic system exceeds the sum of the additions currently being made to those accounts. And thus the net change, the net investment, is negative. Similarly, in a depression, productive expenditure on account of inventory and work in progress plunges, while cost of goods sold, which reflects such productive expenditure made in prior periods, continues to hold up. To the extent that productive expenditure on account of inventory and work in progress drops below cost of goods sold in the economic system, the result is negative net investment in inventory and work in progress. Because what is now signified is that the sum of the additions being made to these accounts correspondingly falls short of the sum of the subtractions. The reduction in the value of the inventory and work-in-progress accounts in the economic system is the extent of the negative net investment of this type. Next, the marginal efficiency of capital doctrines reversal of the actual relationship between net investment and the rate of profit. We are now in a position to make what is perhaps the most decisive objection of all to the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and the Keynesian analysis, 
and that is that our discussion of the determinants of the rate of profit in Chapter 16 has shown that the rate of profit and net investment are positively related. We have seen that net investment and profits move together virtually dollar for dollar, because while profits are the difference between sales revenues and costs, net investment is the difference between productive expenditure, which is almost equivalent to sales revenues, and those same costs. I think I should offer a brief refresher here. Productive expenditure and sales revenues are intimately connected because one huge component of sales revenues is one huge component of productive expenditure, the expenditure for capital goods. The other component of productive expenditure, wage payments by business, is the foundation of the great bulk of, of sales revenues from consumers' goods. Thus, the actual reason the rate of profit is so low or negative in a depression is the same as the reason net investment is so low or negative, namely that productive expenditure has fallen, taking sales revenues with it, while costs, especially depreciation costs, fall only with a lag. By the same token, in the recovery from a depression, net investment and the rate of profit both improve together. For every dollar by which productive expenditures rise relative to costs, creating net investment, sales revenues rise relative to those same costs, creating profits. Likewise, for every dollar by which costs fall relative to productive expenditure, also creating net investment, those same costs fall relative to sales revenues, creating profits. The mathematical implication of this virtual dollar-for-dollar -dollar equivalence between additional net investment and additional profits is that the rate of profit, the so-called marginal efficiency of capital, must actually rise with the rise in net investment and not fall as the Keynesians maintain. For example, if in the depths of a depression, aggregate profit in the economic system is 10, while total accumulated capital is 1,000, then the average rate of profit is a mere 1%. But if now net investment increases by, say, 50, then aggregate profit increases from 10 to 60. At the same time, of course, the total accumulated capital of the economic system rises to 1,050. The average capital outstanding over the period becomes 1,025, V, the average of 1,000 and 1,050. However much it may come as a shock to the Keynesians, the unavoidable implication of these facts is that the average rate of profit rises from 1% to almost 6%. What happens mathematically is exactly the same sort of thing as happens to the season average of a baseball team that goes on a winning streak. In the case of the baseball team, its season average rises in the direction of 1,000. 1,000 is its average over the course of its winning streak, its marginal average, so to speak, and thus its season average rises accordingly. In the case of more net investment and equivalently more profit, the average rate of profit rises in the direction of a mathematical limit of 200%, for the additional net investment is accompanied by an equivalent addition to the amount of profit, and by an addition only half as great to the average capital outstanding in the economic system. As indicated, the rise in the rate of profit that must accompany more net investment in the recovery from a depression has its counterpart in the fall in the rate of profit that accompanies the wiping out of net investment in the descent into a depression. In the latter case, the plunge in productive expenditure not only drives productive expenditure below costs, making net investment negative, but equivalently reduces sales revenues relative to the same costs. This drives profit in the economic system below net consumption. Profit comes to equal net consumption plus a negative net investment component. 
See chapters 15 and 16 of Capitalism for discussions of net investment and its relation to profits. In the light of the foregoing analysis, it is difficult to imagine a more erroneous conception of things than the Keynesian notion that the rate of profit is at a depression level because of too much net investment, and that the further net investment that must accompany recovery from the depression will drive it still lower. The facts are that the rate of profit is low in a depression for the same reasons that net investment is low, to the point of being negative, and will rise with a rise in net investment. In other words, among the changes that would need to be made in the Keynesian analysis, if for some reason one had any wish to retain it, is the reversal of the slope of the so-called MEC and IS curves in the context of recovery from a depression and the reestablishment of full employment. <clears throat> but since the Keynesian system is so thoroughly riddled with errors and contradictions, there is no point in attempting to modify it or retain it in any way. The Keynesian analysis is so wrong that it is beyond redemption. The one fundamental change that is needed is its total abandonment. The contradiction between the marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and the multiplier doctrine. It is worth pointing out the existence of a major contradiction between the marginal efficiency of capital doctrine and the multiplier doctrine. When they propound the marginal efficiency of capital doctrine, the Keynesians claim that the effect of more net investment is a reduction in the rate of profit. Yet when they propound the multiplier doctrine, they claim that the effect of more net investment is a multiplied increase in aggregate demand. In their absurdly narrow view of aggregate demand, of course, this means an increase in net national product, NNP, which is equal to the sum of net emission, which in turn allegedly pay the national income. The additional net investment, they tell us, brings about a diminishing series of additional consumption expenditures, which increases aggregate demand by a multiple of the initial increase in net investment. Now surely, if there is an increase in aggregate demand, aggregate profit must rise. Even on the highly conservative assumption that aggregate profit maintained merely a fixed percentage relationship to aggregate demand, instead of bearing a higher percentage relationship, as a rising demand actually implies, the greater the increase in net investment, the greater would be the increase in the rate of profit. If, for example, profits were assumed to constitute a steady 20% of the national income, which historically is not an unreasonable figure, a multiplier of two would mean an increment of profits 40% as large as the increment of net investment. A multiplier of three would mean an increment of profits 60% as large as the increment of net investment, and so on. Even with a multiplier of only two, the rate of profit on accumulated capital would certainly have to rise as net investment increased, for it is certainly below 40% to begin with, and would move in the direction of 40% on the basis of additional net investment. Indeed, allowing for the fact that the average capital outstanding grows by only half of the additional net investment, the rate of profit would rise toward 80% rather than 40%. The contradiction between the multiplier doctrine and the declining marginal efficiency of capital doctrine is actually much more acute than this example indicates. For I have shown that virtually all of the increase in national income that would accompany the rise in consumption spending that the multiplier is supposed to bring about would be profit income. See Table 15.5 and the surrounding discussion in Chapter 15 of Capitalism. Of course, I have also shown that the multiplier doctrine itself is totally fallacious. The fact that it totally contradicts the marginal efficiency of capital doctrine, which, as shown, is also entirely fallacious, further adds to the indictment of the Keynesian analysis.
a fall in wage rates as the requirement for the restoration of net investment and profitability, along with full employment. Not only do net investment and the rate of profit improve together in the recovery from a depression, but precisely what is required for their improvement is a fall in wage rates. In the context of recovering from a depression, a fall in wage rates is necessary both for the restoration of productive expenditure and thus sales revenues, and for the write-down of the value of existing fixed assets and inventories, which operation reduces the cost deducted from productive expenditure and sales revenues. In both of these ways, a fall in wage rates increases net investment and profits. Thus, it not only brings about full employment, but restores net investment and profitability as well. To elaborate, when wage rates fall to their new equilibrium level, a level corresponding to the reduced velocity of circulation of money and the reduced quantity of money that follows the removal of the artificial monetary stimulus of the preceding boom, the costs of new investments are correspondingly reduced. In response, as I have repeatedly pointed out, investment expenditures which had been postponed, awaiting the necessary fall in wage rates and costs to the lower level, now take place, with the result that productive expenditure and thus sales revenues in the economic system are increased. At the same time, assets acquired in the previous boom at an artificially high level of costs are written down to be competitive with the lower cost investments that can now be made as the result of the fall in wage rates. And this, of course, reduces the cost deducted from productive expenditure and sales revenues. In these ways, the fall in wage rates restores both net investment and profitability. By the same token, as I have also pointed out before, the failure of wage rates to fall operates not only to prolong, but also to deepen the depression to the extent that it causes the postponement of investment expenditures and the consequent wiping out of profitability, it adds to the inability of business firms to repay their debts. This, in turn, causes more bank failures, a further reduction in the quantity of money and velocity of circulation, and thus necessitates greater wage cuts to achieve full employment and recovery than would have been the case if the wage cuts had come quickly. Wage rates, total wage payments, and the rate of profit. The preceding discussion has shown that when unemployment exists, a fall in wage rates operates to increase total productive expenditure. As part of this process, it is virtually certain that total wage payments increase, with the result that the fall in wage rates is actually accompanied by a more than proportionate increase in the quantity of labor demanded, and thus by a more than proportionate increase in the volume of employment. However, it should be realized that the improvement in business profitability will tend to be the greater, the smaller is the portion of the additional productive expenditure that takes the form of wage payments. Indeed, business profitability would increase the most if the fall in wage rates were accompanied by an actual fall in total wage payments and a correspondingly greater increase in the demand for capital goods. The reason for these conclusions is that wage payments tend to show up relatively quickly as costs deducted from sales revenues. In contrast, outlays for machinery and plant show up much more slowly as costs deducted from sales revenues. Thus, if a billion dollars, say, of wage payments were replaced with a billion dollars of spending for plant and equipment, total business profits might very well increase by almost the full billion dollars. This is because total business sales revenues would be unchanged. The demand for capital goods would rise by a billion dollars, while the wage earners' demand for consumers' goods would fall by a billion dollars. At the same time, depreciation cost, 
equal to a relatively small percentage of the billion dollars spent for the plant and equipment, would take the place of the much larger cost figure reflecting the payment of a billion dollars in wages. Thus, total profits in the economic system would rise. By virtue of aggregate sales revenues remaining whatever they were, while aggregate costs deducted from sales revenues fell. Obviously, the increase in net investment would also be correspondingly greater under these conditions. This discussion should serve further to refute the popular Keynesian and labor union doctrine that a fall in wage rates operates to intensify a depression by virtue of reducing total wage payments and thus consumer spending. The truth is that even if the effect of a fall in wage rates really were a reduction in total wage payments and consumer spending, the rate of profit would rise all the more, for all that this effect would really mean would be a shift of sales revenues from the sellers of consumers' goods to the sellers of capital goods, and at the same time a reduction in aggregate costs. Critique of the Paradox of Thrift Doctrine Another popular Keynesian doctrine that calls for special attention is the alleged paradox of thrift. According to this doctrine, the more people attempt to save, the poorer they become. Instead of being a principal foundation of economic progress and prosperity, saving is made to appear as the cause of unemployment and poverty. Samuelson, a leading supporter of this doctrine, states it as follows, quote, In a multiplier model, with unchanged investment, an upward shift in the savings function, reflecting an increase in thriftiness, will actually reduce income and output. How much? Output is reduced in a multiplied way until income falls low enough to bring people's new desired saving again into equality with investment. Thus, an attempt to save more may lead instead to a lower income and no more saving or investment. Just when we have learned poor Richard's wisdom, along comes a new generation of financial wizards who claim that in depressed times the old virtues may be modern sins." End quote. Now, the paradox of thrift doctrine rests entirely on the central notion of the Keynesian analysis that there is room in the economic system for only a strictly limited amount of profitable investment. It is only on this basis that the attempt to save a larger proportion of income implies the necessity of a smaller amount of income. Thus, for example, if there were room in the economic system for only one unit of saving that could be profitably invested, and people sought to save only 1% of their income, their income could be 100 and still be consistent with the allegedly limited profitable opportunities for investment. If, however, they seek to save 20% of their incomes, then their income can be no more than a mere 5 and still be consistent with the allegedly limited profitable opportunities for investment. It should be apparent that the paradox of thrift doctrine is utterly absurd. In the context to which it is meant to apply most strongly, namely that of depression and mass unemployment, saving and investment, far from being at any kind of maximum limit, are extremely low or even negative, as we saw just a little while ago. And as we saw even more recently, it is precisely when saving and investment are restored, as the result of a fall in wage rates, unit costs of production and prices, that the rate of profit is restored, along with full employment. At all other times, as I have shown, there is room for far more profitable investment in the economic system than the power of saving can ever have the capacity to meet. One need only recall the enormous extent of the need for additional capital in its various forms, the extent of the need for savings to finance housing, and the fact that the downtown real estate of a single city all by itself provides an investment outlet for a virtually infinite amount of savings. At the same time, one should recall that the effect of a higher degree of capital intensiveness in the economic system 
is a more rapid rate of economic progress, including, as a byproduct, a more rapid rate of increase in the quantity of commodity money, and thus the corresponding addition of a positive monetary net investment component to the rate of return. On the basis of these facts, it follows that in the absence of financial contraction caused by preceding inflation and credit expansion, the rate of return on capital can be assumed to be not only positive, but sufficiently positive to make investment worthwhile. The Keynesians' preoccupation with the utterly fictitious problem of saving as a cause of poverty bears major responsibility for the very real problem of growing poverty as the result of a lack of saving. Based on their hostile economic analysis of saving, the Keynesians have brought about the enactment of correspondingly hostile government economic policies towards saving. The result has been economic stagnation and decline, whose nature and significance are captured in the words, the Rust Belt. Over a span of approximately two generations, the intellectual rot of Keynesianism has helped to bring about the physical rot of the industrial heartland of the United States. The errors of the Keynesian analysis in connection with saving include its very promulgation of the saving function, in quotes. There is no such thing as saving being a mathematical function of income. Saving out of income continues to exist only because incomes continue to grow as the result of an increase in the quantity of money. As I have shown, if the quantity of money stopped growing, saving out of money income would come to an end once accumulated savings and capital reached a sufficient height relative to income. Nor, as I have shown, is there any actual tendency for saving to constitute a rising share of income as income rises. The appearance of such a tendency is entirely the result of the fact that high incomes largely overlap with incomes that are saved heavily for different reasons, notably high incomes constituted by high rates of profit and high incomes that are considered transitory by their recipients. In connection with saving as a continuing phenomenon, it should be recalled once more that the same cause that brings this about, namely the continuing increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending in the economic system, adds correspondingly to the average rate of profit and interest. Indeed, most of the saving that goes on in the economic system takes place precisely out of this elevated rate of return on capital. This fact, of course, adds still a further perspective on the errors of Keynesianism with respect to saving and its relationship to the rate of return. Critique of the Liquidity Preference Doctrine The final aspect of the Keynesian analysis that must be considered is the liquidity preference doctrine. Liquidity preference, or as Hazlitt aptly describes it, cash preference, is what is supposedly responsible for the existence of a minimum irreducible rate of return below which lenders and investors will not lend or invest. They will allegedly not lend or invest below a 2% rate of return because they would prefer to hold cash instead. Now, on the basis of all that I have established concerning the rate of return, it is virtually certain that in the absence of inflation and credit expansion and the subsequent financial contraction that results, the rate of return would actually be substantially in excess of 2%. But even if it were not, and even if that fact resulted in a tendency toward holding savings in the form of cash, the very existence of that tendency would itself operate to raise the rate of return, as I showed in Chapter 17 on pages 837 and 838. To grasp this proposition, consider the most extreme case. Namely, imagine that all saving took place in the form of cash hoarding. 
In this case, there would be no expenditure for means of production, and thus no costs of production to deduct from sales revenues. However, since consumption expenditure would still exist, there would still be sales revenues. Sales revenues without costs means that profit equals 100% of the sales revenues. Furthermore, with no funds expended for means of production, no capital investment appears anywhere on the balance sheets of business firms. There is nothing present under the head of property, plant, and equipment, and nothing under the head of inventory, work in progress, for nothing has been expended for either of these purposes. A positive money profit divided by a zero money capital invested equals a rate of profit that is infinite. Finally, to whatever extent savings are in the form of cash holdings rather than physical investments, the rate of profit is correspondingly higher. This is because the cash holdings support a certain amount of what in chapters 16 and 17 I called net consumption, which I showed gives rise to profit, and which is the greater relative to the funds invested in physical business assets, the less are those funds, and the greater the funds held in the form of cash. In addition to this, it is also necessary to question the assumption that a 2% rate of return is the minimum at which people are willing to lend or invest. For if for some reason it did become necessary for the economic system to operate with a rate of return below 2%, there would be nothing to prevent it from doing so. The Keynesians advance two arguments that attempt to show why 2% or a rate not far from 2% constitutes the practical lower limit to the rate of return lenders and investors will accept. In the words of Keynes himself, quote, we have assumed so far an institutional factor which prevents the rate of interest from being negative in the shape of money, which has negligible carrying costs. In fact, however, institutional and psychological factors are present, which set a limit much above zero to the practicable decline in the rate of interest. In particular, the costs of bringing borrowers and lenders together and uncertainty as to the future of the rate of interest set a lower limit which in the present circumstances may be as high as two or two and a half percent on long term. End quote. The uncertainty as to the future of the rate of interest that Keynes refers to is the fear that it may rise from its present level and thus create a capital loss for any investor who finds it necessary to sell his investment. For example, a long-term bondholder who buys a bond when interest rates are 2% and must sell it when interest rates rise to 4% and who thus suffers a capital loss. This, of course, is an argument we have already considered. Now, neither of these arguments in fact supports the conclusion that people are unwilling to lend or invest below some arbitrary rate of return. At most, they support the conclusion that at lower rates of return, the demand for money for holding will be somewhat higher than at higher rates of return, and thus that the velocity of circulation of money will be somewhat lower, and wage rates and prices will have to be somewhat lower in order to have full employment. The fact that there are costs of bringing lenders and borrowers together, and of otherwise investing, is always true. The existence of such costs merely requires that in order for lending and investing to be worthwhile, the size of the loan or investment and the period of time for which it is made be of some minimum. For example, as we saw in Chapter 12 of Capitalism, if the cost of making a given type of loan or investment were some minimum amount, such as $100, then at a 2% annual interest rate, it would not pay to lend any sum smaller than $250,000 for a period as short as one week, because that would be the sum required to yield the minimum of $100 in just one week at that annual rate of interest. But it would certainly pay to lend smaller sums for longer periods of time, 
such as $100,000 or even $50,000 for a year. And in fact, when the pooling of small sums is allowed for, as is accomplished every day by such institutions as savings banks, the sums which it pays to lend and invest, even at a rate of return as low as 2%, turn out to be far less than 50000 and for periods far shorter than a year. Indeed, even at a 1% annual rate of return and need for a $100 minimum amount of interest, it would still pay to deposit a sum as small as $10,000 for a period as short as a year. The argument about uncertainty concerning the future of the rate of interest does not fare any better. If the rate of return on capital is extremely low and people hesitate to lend or invest for fear that it will rise, then either they are right in expecting the rate of return to rise or they are wrong. If they are right, then the rate of return rises and the alleged problem of too low a rate of return simply disappears. If they are wrong and the rate of return does not rise, then there is no actual reason to fear the rise and they can lend and invest at the low rate of return. Indeed, if we consider the phenomenon of a rise in the rate of return on capital as such, rather than merely a rise in the rate of interest on loans, and keep in mind that what brings it about in the circumstances of recovery from a depression, namely a recovery of productive expenditure and sales revenues, then it becomes clear that people have good reason to go ahead and invest immediately if they expect the rate of return to rise. This is because if they invest as stockholders or other categories of equity owners, they will actually gain from the rise in the rate of return. And if they do not expect the rate of return to rise, then they have no good reason to abstain from investing out of any fear of security prices falling. The liquidity preference doctrine represents a profoundly wrong explanation of the rate of interest. According to Keynes, the rate of interest is, quote, the reward for parting with liquidity, is a measure of the unwillingness of those who possess money to part with their liquid control over it. It is the price, in quotes, which equilibrates the desire to hold wealth in the form of cash with the available quantity of cash, unquote. And, says Keynes, if this explanation is correct, the quantity of money is the other factor which, in conjunction with liquidity preference, determines the actual rate of interest in given circumstances. End quote. Thus, Keynes' doctrine here is that the rate of interest is determined by the combination of liquidity preference and the quantity of money. And on this basis, he comes to the conclusion that if it is not already at its minimum acceptable level, the rate of interest can be reduced by the mere increase in the quantity of money, if not to zero, then at least to its minimum acceptable level. And he further concludes that by means of reducing the rate of interest in such conditions, namely where it is not yet at its minimum acceptable level, the increase in the quantity of money will serve to make possible an expansion in employment and production, a result of which will be a reduction in the marginal efficiency of capital, in quotes, i.e. the rate of profit. Now the fact is that liquidity preference is not at all a determinant of the rate of interest, much less of the rate of profit. This is dramatically illustrated by conditions under rapid inflation, where the desire to hold money virtually disappears, and the rate of interest, instead of approaching zero, as the liquidity preference doctrine implies, rises to extremely high levels. By the same token, the less rapidly the supply of money increases, and the correspondingly greater is the desire to hold money, the lower is the rate of interest, not the higher again in contradiction of what the liquidity preference doctrine implies. As we have seen, the rate of interest is governed by the rate of profit, not vice versa, and the more rapidly the quantity of money is increased, the higher tends to be the rate of profit, and thus the higher tends to be the rate of interest. The rise in prices that results from an increase in quantity of money 
also contributes to the rise in interest rates in that it brings about increases in the demand for loanable funds to buy goods such as houses, land, and raw materials in the face of prospective higher prices for them. In the absence of higher interest rates, the purchase of such goods would become progressively more profitable the more rapidly the quantity of money increased and prices rose. Interest rates must rise in the face of increases in the quantity of money in order to limit the increase in demand for loanable funds that would otherwise result both from a higher rate of profit and, as far as they are present, rising commodity prices. As I have shown, because the increase in the quantity of money and consequent rise in spending increases the rate of profit and makes prices rise, it is impossible lastingly to reduce, let alone eliminate, the rate of interest by means of increasing the quantity of money. If carried out consistently, such an attempt would entail the continual acceleration of the increase in the quantity of money, and thus the ultimate destruction of the monetary system. It would not eliminate or even lastingly hold down the rate of interest. It should not be necessary to repeat here the critique I have made of the closely associated error of thinking of the rate of interest as the price of money, which Keynes does when he describes the rate of interest as, quote, the price which equilibrates the desire to hold wealth in the form of cash with the available quantity of cash, unquote. Interest is not the price of money, but the difference between the money borrowed and the money repaid, which difference tends to be the greater the more rapidly the quantity of money increases between the time of borrowing and the time of repayment. The critique of the liquidity preference doctrine can be combined with a further critique of Keynes' doctrines concerning consumption, saving, employment, and the rate of profit. We have seen that the problem of unemployment, according to Keynes, rests on the fact that people insist on saving. If they did not save, if they only consumed, the multiplier would allegedly be infinite and full employment would exist. It is instructive to examine Keynes' doctrines precisely in conditions in which there would be no saving whatever, no net saving out of income, and no gross saving out of sales revenues. Such conditions would be similar to those which characterized Adam Smith's early and rude state of society and Marx's CMC sequence, but go beyond them in that there would not even be saving in the form of cash holdings, because everyone would race to consume immediately. In such conditions, not only would there be no saving, but also there would be no liquidity preference. In such conditions, according to Keynes, because there is no saving, employment must be full, and because there is no liquidity preference, the rate of interest and profit must be zero. Yet, in fact, in such conditions, employment would be virtually zero, and the rate of profit and interest would be infinite. This is because there would be no demand for labor in the production of products for sale, and while sales revenues would exist, there would be no productive expenditure, and thus no cost to deduct from sales revenues, and there would be no capital. Thus, as we saw a short while ago, profits would equal the whole of sales revenues, and when divided by zero of capital invested, would yield an infinite rate of return. The Economic Consequences of Keynesianism As I have shown, the essential economic policy advocated by Keynesianism is government budget deficits, which are held to be necessary to prevent or combat mass unemployment. This is the essence of fiscal policy, in quotes. Thus, it should be obvious that matters are misrepresented when fiscal policy is presented as some kind of neutral tool which now must be used to expand the economy and now to slow it down. The underlying economic problem, according to the Keynesians, is mass unemployment, and that requires a continuously expansionary policy, which is believed to be budget deficits. At most, the Keynesians may be prepared to call for a reduction in the size of the deficit if the expansion in spending allegedly induced by it is greater 
than necessary to achieve full employment, and is thus held to contribute to rising prices. In virtually no circumstances does the logic of their position permit them to call for budget surpluses. The most effective method of achieving a budget deficit, according to the Keynesians, is by increasing government spending rather than by reducing taxes. This is because, as we have seen, the so-called government spending multiplier is held to be one larger than the multiplier allegedly associated with a reduction in taxes, and is therefore believed to be correspondingly more, quote, stimulative, unquote. The increase in government spending is held to be truly wonderful. It is alleged to be not only costless, but also the source of a substantial increase in real income, over and above itself. It is held to be the means of absorbing the allegedly destructive additional savings that accompany full employment, and thus of permitting people to benefit from all of the additional output that full employment brings, over and above their additional savings. The savings the government takes allegedly cost people nothing because those savings supposedly could not even be formed in the absence of the government's willingness to take them. And, say the Keynesians, people are then able to keep for themselves all that their additional employment produces over and above those additional savings. Thus, not only is there a free lunch for the government and its clients, but also, the Keynesians believe, the government's willingness to enjoy its free lunch is the necessary basis for the producers being able to produce and enjoy most of their additional product. Thus Keynesianism is consumptionism par excellence, for no doctrine is more adept in claiming that parasitism is a source of actual enrichment to its victims. As I have pointed out repeatedly, Keynesianism is the philosophy which holds that pyramid-building, earthquakes, and even wars may serve to increase wealth. With this philosophy as a starting point, there is almost no program a government could adopt that would not represent a significant improvement in comparison, since it could almost certainly be designed so that at least some people would directly benefit from it public housing, public transportation, public education, socialized medicine, and so forth, all compare favorably with pyramid-building earthquakes and wars in terms of their ability to provide benefits to at least some people for some period of time. The growth in government. An inevitable effect of the influence of such ideas is the increase in the size and scope of government activity. As James Mill observed in criticizing very similar ideas in the early 19th century, quote, were the exhortations to consumption addressed only to individuals, we might listen to them with a great deal of indifference, as we might trust with abundant confidence that the disposition in mankind to save and to better their condition would easily prevail over any speculative opinion and be even little affected by its practical influence. When the same advice, however, is offered to government, the case is widely and awfully changed. Here, the disposition is not to save, but to expend. The tendency in national affairs to improve by the disposition in individuals to save and to better their condition here finds its chief counteraction. Here, all the most obvious motives the motives calculated to operate upon the greater part of mankind urge to expense, and human wisdom has not yet devised adequate checks to confine within the just bounds this universal propensity. Let us consider, then, what are likely to be the consequences should this strong disposition become impelled and precipitated by a prevailing sentiment among mankind. One of the most powerful restraints upon the prodigal inclinations of governments is the condemnation with which expense, at least beyond the received ideas of propriety, is sure to be viewed by the people. But should this restraint be taken off, should the disposition of government to spend become heated by an opinion that it is right to spend, 
and should this be still further inflamed by the assurance that it will by the people also be deemed right in their government to expend. No bounds would then be set to the consumption of the annual produce. Such a delusion could certainly not last for long, but even its partial operation, and that but for a short time, might be productive of the most baneful consequences. End quote. Just as James Mill anticipated, the success of the kind of ideas advocated by Keynes in gaining popular influence has indeed been followed by the most baneful consequences. Among them is an approximately fourfold increase in the relative size of government spending in the United States. Between 1929 and the present day, government spending has increased from approximately 11% of national income to approximately 40%. This has meant a corresponding decline in the freedom of the individual to spend his own income as he chooses, and the imposition of a reign of fear of the tax authorities, as the measures taken by the government to obtain the growing percentage of income have become more and more severe. It has also meant a vast increase in the government's interference in the daily lives of the people in countless other ways as well, which are financed with the government's additional funds. And, of course, there have been other highly destructive consequences, stemming from individuals' loss of control over their incomes and the accompanying growth in government regulation, most notably the undermining of capital accumulation and economic progress. Budget Deficits, Inflation, and Deflation Although Keynesianism is and must be radically opposed to the quantity theory of money, for the reasons explained at the beginning of this lecture. It nevertheless recognizes the need to couple its policy of budget deficits with an expansion in the quantity of money. This is because, even though Keynesianism avows that what increases spending is the mere existence of budget deficits, the fact is that in the absence of sustained increases in the quantity of money, a policy of sustained large-scale budget deficits would inevitably result in the government's bankruptcy. Bankruptcy would be the result because the government's accumulated debt would continue to grow and the burden of servicing the debt would come to require more and more revenue. Increases in taxes would at most only delay the government's bankruptcy, for they would reduce the country's ability to produce and to compete internationally as does, of course, the government's absorption of savings when it borrows to finance its deficits. The government's tax revenues would thus be unable to keep pace with its growing financial obligations caused by the deficits. The rate of interest the government had to pay on its debt would rise. Eventually, the day would come when the government had to repay a portion of its debt and found itself unable to borrow the means of doing so. At that point, it would be bankrupt in the literal sense of the term. The fact that in the absence of the ability to create money, a policy of budget deficits leads to a country's economic and financial decline and the government's bankruptcy means that in such circumstances, a policy of deficits is actually deflationary. This is the case under any kind of meaningful gold standard. Under a gold standard, a policy of deficits has the effect of reducing the supply of gold that circulates within a country's borders. This is because in undermining capital accumulation in the country, the effect of the deficits is to reduce the country's share of world commerce, and thus the share of the world's gold that it possesses. Within the country, moreover, the threat of the government's bankruptcy and its attendant uncertainties must lead to a greater demand for the holding of gold as opposed to productive expenditure and investment. Furthermore, insofar as the monetary system of the country may use government debt as an asset standing behind the issuance of fiduciary media, the quantity of money in the country is further threatened. For any threat to the solvency of the government in such circumstances is a threat to the solvency of the banks that hold its securities as an asset. Thus, under a meaningful gold standard, a policy of deficits 
could not achieve the Keynesian objective of expanding spending, but would sooner or later accomplish the exact opposite. Although they never acknowledged the existence of conditions in which deficits would be deflationary, the Keynesians nevertheless seemed to know very well that such conditions would exist under any real gold standard. And thus, to a man, they are totally opposed to the gold standard, which they do everything possible to ridicule. They oppose the gold standard because they know that if the policy of deficits is in fact to succeed in increasing total spending, the deficits must largely be financed by an increase in the quantity of money, and that the government must have the power to bring about this increase. A gold standard, on the other hand, deprives the government of this power. It makes the increase in the quantity of money depend on the increase in the supply of gold. The Keynesian's advocacy of a policy of budget deficits is an implicit advocacy of inflation. In addition, the Keynesians explicitly advocate inflation in the form of credit expansion, insofar as they believe that it can succeed in reducing the rate of interest, that is, insofar as the rate of interest is not yet at its allegedly irreducible level of approximately 2%. As Chapter 12 has shown, and as the next chapter will show more fully, the creation of money by the government, or with the encouragement of the government, is the essence of the inflation problem. Inflation is the government's creation or sponsorship of the creation of money at a rate more rapid than the increase in the supply of the precious metals. And Keynesianism bears primary responsibility for it in the countries of the Western world today and since the 1930s. Keynesianism and Economic Destruction Thus, in appraising the consequences of the Keynesian policies, it is necessary to charge them with all the destructive consequences of inflation. This includes rising prices and the impoverishment of everyone whose income or assets are contractually fixed in terms of a definite sum of money. It includes the arbitrary redistribution of wealth and income from creditors to debtors, and from those who receive the new money relatively late to those who receive it relatively early. It includes, as does a policy of deficits without resort to inflation, the impairment of capital formation, and thus of the rise in the productivity of labor and real wages. Indeed, if carried out on a large enough scale, capital decumulation and an actual fall in the productivity of labor and real wages are the result. I have said that Keynesianism and its hostility to saving are responsible for the vast economic devastation conveyed in the words, the Rust Belt. This devastation has occurred because under the influence of Keynesianism, literally several trillion dollars of savings have been absorbed in government budget deficits, an amount of savings equal to the growth in the publicly held national debt in the years since the time of Keynes. Over this period, confiscatory taxation applied to large personal incomes and to corporate profits, capital gains, and inheritances have prevented trillions more of savings from being made in the first place, or in the case of inheritance taxes, being kept. Such taxation has been strongly supported by Keynesianism precisely because the taxes fall on saving. As we shall see, inflation too, like inheritance taxes, destroys savings already accumulated and does so on a vast scale. Thus factories, machinery, stocks of materials and supplies, power plants, railroads, bridges, tunnels, and homes that these savings and potential savings would have made possible have not come into existence because the necessary savings have been diverted into financing the government's budget deficits, have been prevented from occurring in the first place, or have been prevented from being maintained. The result has been a sharp decline in the rate of economic progress in the United States if not outright economic stagnation, and increasing difficulty in replacing existing capital assets when they wear out.
In connection with this last, under conditions even of modest increase in the overall supply of capital goods, let alone stagnation or outright capital decumulation, the very fact of the economic development of new areas, such as the U.S. Far West, implies the economic decline of older areas. This is the case because in such conditions, additional capital for the one, or at least additional capital for the one, over and above any modest increase in the total of capital, can be obtained only by failing to provide replacement capital for the other. Ironically, as we shall see, a further consequence of the inflation inspired by Keynesianism is a wiping out of the real rate of return on capital and the creation of conditions in which people actually do find it necessary to hoard their savings, not to be sure in the form of depreciating paper money, but in the form of physical assets whose prices can rise, above all, gold and silver. Inflation ultimately destroys the private granting of credit, calling for repayment in paper money, and makes impossible the writing of contracts of any kind, which are stated in terms of a fixed sum of money. For a variety of reasons, it has an inherent tendency to go on accelerating until the point is reached at which paper money ceases to be acceptable in commerce. At that point, if the government has prevented the development of a new money that the market would create in the form of gold and silver, inflation actually succeeds in the destruction of money altogether, and with it of an indispensable foundation of a division of labor society. Along the way, inflation creates the potential for a major depression, which is actualized if the inflation is stopped, sharply slowed, or indeed even fails to accelerate sufficiently. Finally, it must be kept in mind that inflation is responsible for the imposition of wage and price controls, which are enacted in misguided efforts to stop it. As I showed in chapters 7 and 8, wage and price controls create economic chaos and culminate in a totalitarian socialist dictatorship and economic collapse. Thus Keynesianism and the policies it gives rise to have played a leading and essential role in causing the economic decline of the United States that has become visible over the last generation and which is likely to continue. Keynesianism is a consistent assault on the foundations of prosperity. It is anti-saving, anti-gold, anti-balanced budgets, anti-limited government, ironically, what it is not anti is unemployment. It is not the solution for unemployment. Why Keynesianism is not a full employment policy. The Keynesian policies of deficits and inflation are not only not necessary for the achievement of full employment, but do not achieve it. Indeed, deficits by themselves, apart from the creation of money, actually cause more unemployment both because of their deflationary effects explained above and because in depriving business of capital funds, they reduce the ability of business to make productive expenditures and thus to pay wages. And, as I explained in Chapter 13, even when the deficits are combined with inflation of the money supply, much, most, or even all of the extra spending that takes place can be nullified by wage increases that are just as rapid, or even more rapid, with the result that little or no additional employment is actually achieved. Furthermore, as I also explained in Chapter 13, much of any additional employment that might be achieved is likely to be of little or no economic value to those whose production must pay for it, because of the inherent nature of the output of those re-employed in connection with government make-work projects. Finally, the inflation and credit expansion Keynesianism leads to, and the artificial elevation of the velocity of circulation and stimulus to indebtedness that result, help to create a constant potential for a new depression and mass unemployment. As I have shown, what brought about full employment in World War II 
was not the Keynesian policies of deficits and inflation by themselves, but their coupling with wage and price controls. It was this which finally established a relationship between wage rates and prices on the one side and the quantity of money and volume of spending on the other that enabled the volume of spending for goods and labor to buy all that was offered. Of course, this same result could have been achieved by a free market in labor without any of the loss of output, not to mention human life, that took place on the battlefields of the war and without any of the shortages and economic chaos caused by wage and price controls. Thus, even when applied in combination with wage and price controls, Keynesianism should not be thought of as a full employment policy, but as the policy that succeeds in destroying the economic value of full employment. Keynesianism versus the rate of profit. Quote, the euthanasia of the rentier, end quote, and, quote, the socialization of investment, end quote. Keynesianism's concern with the alleged lowness of the rate of profit at the point of full employment turns out to be nothing but a shedding of crocodile tears. As I have said, the effect of its policies is to wipe out the real rate of return on capital and actually to cause the very hoarding of saving it claims to fear. To discover how Keynesianism accomplishes this, it is not necessary to wait until the discussion of inflation in the next chapter. The fact that the Keynesian policies reduce the real rate of return on capital is implied precisely in its attempt to neutralize current savings, either by absorbing them in budget deficits that will never be repaid, or by seizing them outright through taxation. The savings that are taken away, by these or any other methods, for the most part, come out of the rate of return. They are the result of saving specifically out of profit and interest income. Thus, taking them away is tantamount to taking away part of the rate of return itself. For taking away savings means, at the same time, taking away the profits and interest that are the source of the savings. The Keynesian policies are dishonest. Even if the Keynesian analysis were correct, which it certainly is not, the question would have to be asked of why it does not consider trying to raise the effective rate of return by reducing taxes on profits and interest. Only after all taxes on profits and interest had been eliminated would it be legitimate to talk of a problem of too low a rate of return in the economic system. The fact is that when all is said and done, it turns out that Keynesianism is really not concerned with any alleged insufficiency of the rate of return. That is merely a convoluted pretext for more government intervention. Its actual belief, expressed by Keynes in the final chapter of the general theory, is that the rate of return is too high. If this is difficult to believe in view of the diminishing marginal efficiency of capital and unemployment equilibrium doctrines, which are the core of his book and of the whole Keynesian analysis, consider the following passages which are in Keynes' own words. They begin with an implicit reference to the alleged paradox of thrift doctrine and with an expression of satisfaction that on the basis of that doctrine his analysis allegedly deprives great inequality of wealth of one of its, quote, chief social justifications, end quote. Quote, Thus our argument leads toward the conclusion that in contemporary conditions the growth of wealth, so far from being dependent on the abstinence of the rich, as is commonly supposed, is more likely to be impeded by it. One of the chief social justifications of great inequality of wealth is therefore removed. I am not saying that there are no other reasons, unaffected by our theory, capable of justifying some measure of inequality in some circumstances. But it does dispose of the most important of the reasons why hitherto we have thought it prudent to move carefully. For my own part, I believe that there is social and psychological justification 
for significant inequalities of incomes and wealth, but not for such large disparities as exist today. Much lower stakes will serve the purpose equally well as soon as the players are accustomed to them. End quote. On the next three pages, Keynes goes on with his newly revealed theme that profits are actually too high under capitalism. He even adopts a style of language which sounds hardly distinguishable from Marxism. Quote, I feel sure that the demand for capital is strictly limited in the sense that it would not be difficult to increase the stock of capital up to a point where its marginal efficiency had fallen to a very low figure. Now, though this state of affairs would be quite compatible with some measure of individualism, yet it would mean the euthanasia of the rentier, and consequently the euthanasia of the cumulative oppressive power of the capitalist to exploit the scarcity value of capital. I see, therefore, the rentier aspect of capitalism as a transitional phase which will disappear when it has done its work. And with the disappearance of its rentier aspect, much else in it besides will suffer a sea change. It will be, moreover, a great advantage of the order of events which I am advocating that the euthanasia of the rentier, of the functionless investor, will be nothing sudden, merely a gradual but prolonged continuance of what we have seen recently in Great Britain, and will need no revolution. Thus, we might aim in practice, there being nothing in this which is unattainable, at an increase in the volume of capital until it ceases to be scarce so that the functionless investor will no longer receive a bonus, and at a scheme of direct taxation which allows the intelligence and determination and executive skill of the financier, the entrepreneur, et hoc genus omni, translation, and all of this genus, who are certainly so fond of their craft that their labor could be obtained much cheaper than at present to be harnessed to the service of the community on reasonable terms of reward. In other words, Keynes sees the effect of his policies as that of accomplishing the just demands of Marxism, the expropriation of the expropriators, and the redistribution of their allegedly excessive and ill-gotten wealth to the state and the population at large, but without the necessity of a violent revolution. Not surprisingly, he advocates the socialization of investment. Quote, Furthermore, it seems unlikely that the influence of banking policy on the rate of interest will be sufficient by itself to determine an optimum rate of investment. I conceive, therefore, that a somewhat comprehensive socialization of investment will prove the only means of securing an approximation to full employment. End quote. The meaning of this last passage is that Keynes thinks it unlikely that an increase in the quantity of money, which is what he means by, quote, banking policy, unquote, will be sufficient by itself to drive the rate of return below 2%, and that investment by the government, which will be willing to invest at a rate of return below 2%, will be necessary. Keynes claims to believe that nothing momentous is involved in the socialization of investment, for he immediately adds the words, quote, but beyond this, no obvious case is made out for a system of state socialism which would embrace most of the economic life of the community, end quote. These words, in turn, are quickly followed by the admission, quote, moreover, the necessary measures of socialization can be introduced gradually and without a break in the general traditions of society, end quote. It should be obvious, of course, that since the total of all the capital that is accumulated is nothing but the summation of the investments of the preceding years, full socialization requires nothing more than the socialization of new investment plus the lapse of time. Nevertheless, incredibly, Keynes is touted as a man who saved capitalism. Keynes' views in the above passages are so confused that it may well be the case 
that he believed 2% was simultaneously an excessively high rate of return, providing unnecessarily high stakes to the, quote, players, unquote, and too low a rate of return. Or, when he complained of the rate of return being too high, he may simply have forgotten his arguments about the rate of return being too low. Or perhaps he never took them very seriously in the first place. The following statement, taken from the middle of his book, appears to support this latter view. Quote, there is the possibility, for the reasons discussed above, that after the rate of interest has fallen to a certain level, liquidity preference may become virtually absolute, in the sense that almost everyone prefers cash to holding a debt which yields so low a rate of interest. In this event, the monetary authority would have lost effective control over the rate of interest. But whilst this limiting case might become practically important in the future, I know of no example of it. The inescapable implication of these words is that Keynes knows no actual example of the existence of an unemployment equilibrium, and that his entire doctrine is purely in the realm of the hypothetical. For if the rate of interest is not actually at its alleged minimum acceptable level, Keynes has no grounds, even on his own terms, of asserting the existence of an unemployment equilibrium. Thus it appears that Keynes' actual objections to capitalism may well have been based merely on the standard resentments against inequality and the alleged injustice of the existence of profit and interest, and that his doctrine was merely an added pretext for government intervention. The government must intervene because the rate of profit is too high, and if that objection does not gain sufficient support, then because the rate of profit is too low, which is the argument of the body of Keynes' analysis. In any case, the government must intervene and seize more power. Any argument that serves will do. And thus Keynesianism ends exactly where it began, a piece of flotsam and jetsam from the wreckage of critical thought that is carried along by the tide of irrationalism and anti-capitalism.